It's great to see everyone today. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. It's my first time here at VCF, so I was excited to go around the museum and see some of the cool technology that's here. My name is Jerry Krishi, and I just retired from 35 years in the ed tech industry. I started out as a high school student using computers, then a graduate student, then I was a computer teacher, and then I became a computer coordinator, and then finally director of technology, a school administrator. I had two software companies along the way. And what I hope today is to give you a behind the scenes tour of what happened in ed tech over the course of the last 35 years. So I'm not gonna say how old I am, but this is a picture of me at one of the conferences I had to present at. They told me to dress as my favorite video game character. Anyone know what character this is? Pong, that's right. I am the paddle in Pong. <laughs> the first video game, <laughs> the first video game that I used. <laughs> yep. So, you know, if you're ever a tech director, those of you that work in schools know that the tech directors sometimes view themselves as a superhero. I always thought I was Tom Cruise, frankly, you know, Mission Impossible, teachers needing help with technology. But, the, you know, coming, rescuing them, being the person that can help them with their computers. But the truth is, I was more like a different Tom. This really describes my career. I was Tom Hanks and Forrest Gump. And if you know the movie, you know, Forrest is a character that's been through all of the key events in US history. Over time, he was there. And just like Forrest, I feel like I was there for the revolution. I, through just luck and happenstance and some connections, happened to be present at many of the key events in ed tech history over the course of the last 35 years. I had a front row seat to what was going on in education technology. And I'm gonna share some of those stories for the first time with you today. Now, I was intrigued by this article that came out just before I started this work. It was 1983 and was called Computers in the Schools, What Revolution? It was by Mark Tucker, who was working at a national organization. And he says, 1983 may have represented the zenith of interest in computers and education in the United States. And he is one of many um, individuals who over course of the course of time has doubted that the computer would really revolutionize education. What I'm gonna to propose to you today is that there were three eras of ed tech. The first, I'm gonna call the formative years of ed tech, starting in 1980 and going for about 30 years. I'm gonna spend most of my time there. And then 2010, I'm gonna call the modern era of ed tech, and 2020 and beyond, ubiquitous technology. Technology is everywhere because of the pandemic, and um, I won't spend a lot of time there because, of course, it's the vintage computer conference. I know you guys wanna see the old stuff. Each one of these errors features an inflex series of inflection points or events in history that really changed things dramatically. I'm going to talk about those as well. And finally, as I was going over this work and I prepared for this presentation over the course of two weeks just going through my archives that I've kept um, in my basement, there really were three themes that emerged. One is that technology and education mirrored what was happening in society, and you're going to see that as we go forward. The second is that there's no surprise, history repeats itself. And the third is that there was a lot of competition and war um, in the story of ed technology, and you'll see some of that as well. So before we begin, I want to talk about the dawn of computers. I have to go all the way back to 1946 to the ENIAC, and I was so excited to go into the computer museum today and see um, the model of the ENIAC in the room in 3D. I'd never seen that before. This is the ENIAC. It was revealed to the public in 1946. It was a secret military project was housed at the University of Pennsylvania right down the road. And the distinguishing features of this computer is that it was unveiled to the public on Valentine's Day in 1946 after the war. It was designed to plot missile trajectories during the war and had 17,000 vacuum tubes. And my understanding is that every three days at least one of them failed and needed about 15 minutes to fix. In my journey in ed tech a couple of years ago, I was presenting at a conference and I met a woman, her name is Christina Engelbart, and we introduced ourselves to each other. She told me that her father invented many of the technologies that we use today in computers. And I'd never heard of him before. His name is Doug Engelbart. And basically, if you take a look at his website, which she maintains, it goes over a lot of this technology. He did something called the mother of all demos. And if you go to YouTube, you can actually watch this demonstration, the entire video. I'm gonna show you two small excerpts today. Um, basically, the first one talks about how he invented the mouse, and the second one is how he invented video conferencing. Okay, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working 
and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. I mean, I know why they call it a mouse. Take a look at that, right? <laughs> Let's take a look at the first use of video conferencing. Now, computer, do the automatic switching that will bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work. You can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. Now, this all happened at the Stanford Research Institute back in that time in 68. Three years later, um, Seymour Papert, who was at MIT, and Cynthia Solomon, who worked with him, wrote a program that's kind of a benchmark in educational technology history. They wrote a paper. It's called 20 Things to Do with the Computer. And in that paper, they talked about ways that children might be able to use technology using a computer language called Logo. Some of you may have used that, actually, in, in your own elementary school, where Turtle was used to draw different things on the screen using ideas of mathematics. And this is all part of the paper. It's available online. You can go and read the paper back then, what they said back then, um, to describe that. And then 72, the first video game, Pong, came out. That had influence on the EdTech industry. We'll see that in just a moment. And then this other person, Alan Kay, you may have heard of him. Um, he was a researcher at Xerox, Palo Alto. And back in 1972, he had a prediction about a computer. And he said that, um, he speculates about the emergence of a personal portable information manipulator and their effects when used by both children and adults. He said, it's not science fiction. We should have one of these someday. As a matter of fact, he made a sketch to show what it could look like in 1972. He called it the Dynabook. It's about a foot long. It has a keyboard on the bottom and a screen on top. And he made a prototype. Now, this prototype was just made out of wood. It didn't really do anything with technology, but showed what it could look like. And then he says that, you know, this computer will come out someday with a target price of about $500. Now, what was the first price of the iPad? $4.99. I mean, he was very prescient in terms of what he was able to predict back then. And then the birth of the STEM movement also happened during that time. People think that STEM is a new thing, but I remember back in high school, I had this electronics kit from Radio Shack. Um, many of you may have had it too. And of course, back then, technology was only for boys, right? According to what was, the, what was advertised on here, was to see all little boys becoming junior engineers, working on technology. And this is what the kit looked like. And basically, it had different parts and different components. And the uh, highlight of the kit was right in the middle. They had an integrated circuit for the first time in IC. And you could make different things with, this, um, with this, these projects. So then 1977 happened, and it was the birth of home computers, starting out with these three main players, the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the Radio Shack TRS-80, which some of you in the room may have used. Um, the TRS-80 was famous because it featured a language called BASIC, um, and it was the um, manual of the computer was really geared toward having students learn basic, basic programming, and many of them did. Here's a screenshot from that manual. Now, I started my journey in 1977. I was in high school, and I was a freshman, and I wanted to take the school's computer science course, and unfortunately, they said freshmen could not take the course. I begged the department chair, the math department chair, if I could take it. He said, no, but I tell you what, if I give you the textbook, and you do the problems every week. I'll meet with you on Fridays, and I will um, help grade your assignments so you can see what it's like. Even though I didn't use the computer, I could had the opportunity to write the code. And that really was my start. Um, and I thank that teacher for supporting me during that time. Back then, there were cards that were used to read into the computer. I never read the, I never used those. But I did use this machine. It was a PDP-8. And at the very top, it had a tape machine where it would store programs at the very bottom, there were a bunch of switches that we were told not to touch. I still have to this day, have no idea what they do. Um, but uh, we didn't touch those because we wanted to use a computer. And we shared the computer with um, our rival high school. And basically, one year, one school got the computer and a terminal, and the other school got two terminals but no computer. They just talked over the phone line, and they went back and forth. So. This is the, the computer that I worked on. I got to show it to um, my son, actually, today, because there's one in the computer museum here. It was a teletype machine that was connected with the keyboard and, of course, the paper roll where the programs came out and the paper tape where programs were stored and printed. And the tape looked like this, and here's what the computer sounded like. Uh, this is what it printed, and here's what it sounded like. So it's printing out a program.
and there's a tape head. And um, you know, I was so pleased to go into the exhibit hall today and see someone had this program where it actually prints words out on the tape. We had that back then in the 70s as well. Um, now, you may be wondering, where did those little dots go? Well, here's how the machine was set up, little holes. As was printing, they printed and they went into a little container. Now you can imagine um, a bunch of high school, mostly boys, what did we do with those dots? <laughs> well, in the room, there was an air conditioner. <laughs> and of course, we would take the dots and pour them into the air conditioner, so when the first person of the day came in, usually the teacher, the dots would go, flat. you're laughing, you probably did the same thing, right? <laughs> of course, it was a thing. <laughs> Now, those were exciting times to be alive, but it also was a bit scary because we were in the middle of a nuclear arms race with Russia. And as a result of that, a lot of the games and things that we programmed dealt with our anxiety at the time. Like I made a program called Intercept that dealt with intercepting Russian ballistic missiles back in basic. But it also was an exciting time, right? There are a lot of uh, things in the news about UFOs and the movie Close Encounters came out in 77. Um, and so we had games like you know, Lunar Lander, where you had to try and land your, um, your lunar module on the moon. Of course, there were no graphics. Everything was done with, with just text back then, but it was still as exciting. And then this movie came out. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called Star Wars. And um, you know, we made Star Wars games as well. Now, these are the Star Wars ships. You may not recognize them, right? This is a TIE, this is an X-Wing fighter. You know, in our brains, we were thinking of this, even though it really was a greater than and less than symbol with an asterisk in the middle kind of looked like that. And then of course we had the um, TIE fighter, which was made by the two exclamation points with the asterisk in the middle as well. And this was kind of like a battleship game that we played with the theme with Star Wars, and we helped program. Then there was this other thing called Star Trek and Klingons, and that was a really popular computer game at the time as well. And basically it looked a lot like battleship. You tried to shoot the, um, you know, the uh, Klingons with torpedoes and other things. So in 1980, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just state that I think 1980 is like the hard line for the birth of the ed tech industry. Once again, this is just my, my perspective. You may disagree with it, but I think 1980 was it. Because um, the Commodore VIC-20 came out, but not because of that. It's really what defines a discipline. And when I was in grad school, we talked about this. We're in this master's program in computer education that we actually have a discipline we're studying. Well. A discipline, we said, would be something that has a sizable body of work or research that can be classified. You can identify leaders in that field who were nationally known or internationally known, and it had a set of skills that could be mastered. And so back then, in 1980, there were two key books that emerged that established the leadership piece that we needed. One was Seymour Papert's book, Mindstorms, Children, Computers, and Powerful Ideas. And Papert, who was a professor at MIT, made the uh, statement at the time, which many people thought was a little bit crazy. He said that, you know, instead of having computers programming children through programmed instruction, maybe we should have the child programs the, program the computer. It was kind of a revolutionary idea. And he developed this language with some other people called Logo that allowed students, young children even, to do things with the computer. So on the screen you had a turtle. How many people here have used Logo before? All of you good, I won't demonstrate it by acting it out then. We all know what Logo is, right? Okay, good. And the growth of Logo continued throughout the years. There are different versions, different um, things that were kind of spin outs from Logo, and it's really present today through the use of something called Scratch that we'll talk about. The second person that emerged during that rev revolution was um, Robert Taylor. He was a professor at Teachers College at Columbia. He had a book called Computer in the School, Tutor, Tool, 2T. And he was the first person to create a classification system, a taxonomy for how we could classify how the computer was used in education. And he said you could use it as a tutor, which would be drill and practice software. Today we might be use, it, you know, use YouTube as a way to ha have the computer be a tutor for us. The second way was as a tool, so using something like a word processor back then. Today it could be Google Docs or Office 365 or any other tool we may use. And the last one is computer as a 2T. And this is where you program the computer. Back then it was Logo. Today it could be Scratch. It could be any other computer language. And his taxonomy, his way of classifying software, is still used today. Now, getting into the 80s, the personal computers beginning, you know, started to evolve. There was the Apple IIe, which was very widely used in schools, the IBM PC, 
and my first computer, the Commodore 64. And here I am, back in the 80s, um, with the Commodore 64. I really enjoyed programming it because the Commodore 64 was a, tech, was a computer that was very well documented as far as programming. They had the 64 reference guide. They had a book called Mapping the 64. So if you really wanted to make your own games, which I'd like to do, there are a lot of resources available back then for that computer. And of course, then in 81, Time Magazine didn't do the person of the year. They realized that the computer was the person of the year, and the computer moved in. And of course, 1984, the Macintosh came out, and that really changed a lot of things. So I started graduate school in 1985. I went down to the University of Pennsylvania, not just because the first computer was invented there, but they were in the few places in the country that had a master's program in computer education. And the program was kind of unique in that they said, the professor said, they would focus on a timeless education. We wouldn't just be learning about technology that would be obsolete in a year or two or three. We were going to learn both the theory of education and also practice working with it in schools. And then the last thing was they did something called Educational North, which I'll talk about. But even back then in the program, one of the goals was to, was to examine the impact of artificial intelligence. Now, of course, there's nothing like ChatGPT back then, but we were certainly thinking about it in the readings we were doing. Matter of fact, read, many of the readings were like from the Great Books program. So, you know, books like Raymond Callahan's Education and the Cult of Efficiency, books about education from John Locke, Godel Escher Bach, uh, Hofstetter's book, and John Dewey, who wrote the classic book on education, Democracy and Education. And what John Dewey said in his book was kind of like the baseline book for a lot of the courses that I took, was a statement that I think really embodied a lot of the best parts of the computer movement and my coursework at the time. He says, nothing has brought pedagogical theory, educational theory, into greater disrepute than the belief that it is identified with handing out to teachers recipes and models to be followed in teaching. Mechanical rigid woodenness is an inevitable corollary of any theory which separates mind from activity motivated by a purpose. Basically saying that a lot of teachers are being taught how to do things in all, really all of their teaching, but they weren't told why. You know, why do we do it this way? Just learning the technique doesn't allow you to do anything with it. And so this idea of educational north was that no matter what happens in technology, there would be a philosophy that focused you on what was really important over the years. And that philosophy was constructionism, also constructivist as it's sometimes been called, very similar. And that is these ideas that are very important. Students are responsible for constructing their own knowledge. They're engaged in authentic problem solving, in the best of education. And the teacher serves as a facilitator and lets students really take the lead. And that was the philosophy of the program. Well, the other thing I got when I started grad school was my Commodore 128. I upgraded that Commodore 64. And I started a career um, writing for some technology magazines. So the first publication I had was Computes Gazette for the Commodore 64. And I wrote this program called Automation because I really enjoyed uh, the dream of really creating something that was showing 3D graphics. And the program got published and it made it to the magazine and it basically generates different images that, that look like they're three-dimensional. Now the truth is that they weren't three-dimensional at all. It just used things to make them look 3D, some kind of programming. Of course, there was the accompanying diskette for the program, and then you could also go into the back of the magazine where the program listing was there and you could type it into your computer. And what would happen if you made one typo? <laughs> Wouldn't work, right? You had to make sure you did it perfectly. Um, I was lucky in that that article was then published later on in a book about the Commodore 128, and I got for the first time as a, as a writer, I got royalties from it. Now, the $7 check that I got every month was not really going to do things for me, but it did make me seem like I was a legitimate writer at that point. Later on in my second year of grad school, I did write a program to do that real 3D um, transformation. I called it uh, 128 3D. And basically, um, it used a lot of advanced math, specifically within trigonometry, to make things turn around um, the z-axis, to really turn around in three-dimensional space. Now, I didn't love math in high school. I really wasn't a strong math student. But for the first time, I understood why trigonometry was important, because it was something that I needed to do for my project. And I incorporated that into the code that I used to eventually make the program. 
And of course, being a child of the Star Wars era, the model that I made was a um, TIE fighter, which could actually rotate in 3D on the screen. Now, it would take about 60 seconds for it to draw on the Commodore screen, but it did work um, using that. And that was the first time, like I said, I understood the idea behind trigonometry. It was real to me. Well, the other part of the program was working with students. And I did a lot of that with students with their Apple IIEs here in a library because there was no internet at the time, so they would have to do reports and research and use real books back then. Um, and then I actually got a job in the Moore School of Engineering, which was where the ENIAC was built. So I had the sense of history that I was working in the building where the first computer um, was revealed to the public. And it looked like this. When I walked into the building every day, you could see parts of the ENIAC in the hallway. Eventually, they had to put it behind glass because I think some people were helping themselves to see various souvenirs. Um, but um, here's what the ENIAC looked like. And you'll see the model if you go here in the museum. It was huge. It, it actually went across three walls of the building. And um, the reason they put it in that building is that building used to be a piano factory. And so the floors could support the weight of these huge um, metal pieces that made up the machine. I was excited because I was in school during the 40th anniversary of the ENIAC in 1986, and the university was going to have a celebration that was going to feature J. Presper Eckert, one of the two people who invented the first computer. And I really wanted to go. So I went to the um, engineering office and I said, look, I'm a writer. Um, I'm going to write this article for Byte magazine about the ENIAC. Uh, could I get a ticket? And they just put my name on the list. I thought they'd have no shot at getting this. But sure enough, about two months later, I received an invitation to the ENIAC 40th anniversary celebration. Um, it was at the Franklin Institute, and it was a black tie optional affair. And I ended up going to the celebration. I was the only one not in a black tie. I couldn't afford a tuxedo at the time. But I was sitting right there at the table with people from you know, the CEO of, of all the big technology companies and vice presidents of different companies. I identified myself as a writer for Byte Magazine because I really was going to write the article. I never did, but anyway, it was great to just go to the, um, to the event and, and be part of history and once again see the revolution happening before my eyes. And so in 87, um, finished grad school, started teaching, and this is what the computer lab looked like back then. We were fortunate in the school I was in. We just got new Apple II GS computers, so I could do a lot with those students. And uh, the one thing that was really popular at the time in educational technology was mirroring once again, what was happening in society, and that's the whole desktop publishing movement, right? We had um, dot matrix printers that could actually print fonts and graphics, eventually laser printers. We wouldn't see those till later. But of course, the big thing back then was I would try and collect as many fonts as I could from my, from my students to use, all from the public domain. And uh, you know, the model that we had back then, those of you who lived through that era know as it was, whoever dies with the most fonts wins, because everyone wanted to get all their fonts they could even though they never used them, there was this big thing about collecting fonts to have them. Um, and of course, clip art was very important to have that available um, to students. And there was a whole set of books that came out about desktop publishing as well. Now, what the students did was they created re reports and brochures. They were actually using this watered-down desktop publish publishing software, but learning about graphic design in eighth grade. One of the projects I did with them is something called Memories, Reflections, and Dreams. We called it our MRD. And I invented it as a teacher because I taught eighth grade, and I wanted these eighth graders to think about memories they had in, high, in elementary school, reflections of where they were, and also their dreams for the future. I actually have these documents in my basement. They're stored. I told them I'd put them in a time capsule. What I want to do is contact the school and see if I could locate these students, have them read about what they wrote um, many years ago. And they did desktop publishing. They put these little booklets together that consisted of you know, essays and some writing and poetry, things like that. You know, These lists I had them fill out. Here's an eighth grader, says his two best qualities are dependable and quick learner. Two worst qualities are laziness and forgetful. That could be almost any eighth grader, right? But that's what he was really being honest about himself. And then there was you know, this idea of simulations that were really very powerful. And I was fond of simulations, even though they were text-based at the time. This one that came out of the Educational Technology Center up in Boston was called the Immigrant Project. And in that project, students actually used databases and spreadsheets to look at uh, information about real data from the Irish potato famine in 1840. 
and they had to actually create a budget for their family. They had to find living uh, con you know, accommodations for their family, get them a job, and it, they loved it because it made them do something that was really real. And then, because I was a basic programmer, I wrote a program for the students that was a stock market simulation, and that became a big deal. I got a lot of you know, local coverage, local newspaper, cable TV um, came over, and then I left the district um, for a new opportunity in Scarsdale, New York, where I started out as the elementary computer teacher for five different schools. Now, at that time, if you're in computer education, there is this large annual event called the National Educational Computer Conference, NEC, and it happened in different cities around the country. And I just want to give you a sense of the papers that were presented at that time, so you can see where computer computing and education was in the early 1900, 1990s. It took place in Dallas, so textbook and technology innovations. As I said, it took place in Dallas, so they gave us all a little um, neck tech to have. This was Apple's. There was one on keyboarding, which was a big deal in the beginning, keyboarding, writing in the elementary school. And this one really caught my eye when I went back to look at it. A new opportunity to prepare technologically competent education majors. And the author actually says that there was troubling technology incompetence in the undergraduate education program. He was very upset that they didn't understand how to use computers. And at that conference, a significant event happened in educational technology. I was sitting in the audience in a huge room like this, uh, with one of my other colleagues from the district, and IBM announced that they were going to get into education. Up until that point, they'd only been a business company. And they started a company, they started an initiative called EduQuest. What I'm gonna show you today hasn't been shown in probably 30 years. I got a copy of the video that they showed to the attendees, about 8,000 people in the audience, about their vision of what the future of technology would look like. And I took just three short excerpts to show you. The first one is an excerpt that shows what administrative technology would look like. And it shows here the principal of the school. There's the school secretary. He's sitting there in the lower corner. He's video conferencing in. She's doing the schedule. And once again, that was really accurate because you know today we do our schedules on smart boards. You could do the same kind of thing. The other vision they had was using uh, computers and instruction. And here's what they thought the classroom of the future would look like. This afternoon, Greg will visit an Indonesia that is virtually real. He will move through museums and absorb the imagery of faraway libraries. Wow! He will construct his own interpretation of knowledge through art and music and scientific fact. Now we have that today, right? Kids can go on onto the internet and get any information they want. Of course, we have our immersive uh, lenses they can wear as well. So once again, it was pretty predictive. And then finally, technology at home. One, two, three, four, five. Five nickels and a quarter. Thank you. So, you know, they were predicting like the iPad, right? We can do that today. We have a flat panel that we can use that move things around the screen. And of course, technology was in the mind of parents. This, you know, they didn't know what to do with this new technology their, their kids were using. And at that point, um, I was asked to be a columnist for Kids and Computer Magazine, a new magazine that came out. And I wrote a monthly column about elementary computer education. Each one had a different theme, you know, telecommunications. I wrote about the fact that technology should not just be for boys. We should have gender equity in technology. Um, talked about writing and a whole bunch of other topics that came out once a month. And then I ventured up to MIT in 1993 for a conference. I had a paper selected at the Media Lab. It was at the 10th International Technology Conference, so that there had been 10 years of these conferences happening. And the paper was on something called um, Computer Enhanced Instruction. And the idea that I put before the group, and I still have the overheads that I used um, is that computers really should, uh, schools should teach a limited number of things. How to communicate with technology, how to manage information, and how to solve problems through programming. So focusing on learning how to integrate tools, how to easily replicate things, 
keeping students in control and cooperative learning. A lot of the same philosophy I got from my um, graduate work. And the computer activity should include not just activities on the computer, but also off the computer as well. While I was there at MIT, I met a graduate student, Yasmin Kafai, who later became a professor. She was in a doctoral program. And she had wrote um, a lot on the topic of game design, having students program their own games. And that really influenced a lot of the work that I did after that. <clears throat> I also met Dr. Uh, Mitch Resnick, who became head of MIT's uh, Lifelong Kindergarten group and wrote the book Lifelong Kindergarten. He was a grad student at the time. Um, once again, inspired by all his work about students and programming together. And then Logo Writer came out, which was the marriage between logo and word processing. Once again, Logo tried to, I think, jump on the bandwagon of what was popular at the time. And then I was doing some work uh, writing, some freelance writing for Scholastic Publications, and I got a call about helping out with something called the Scholastic Network. This was going to be the first commercial network that was going to be offered to schools, and they asked me to help write um, parts of the manual. It was hosted by AOL at the time, because there was no real internet, and it had customized content for schools. And so I wrote about things like how telecommunications would help students understand the importance of diversity and seeing uh, what other cultures could look like. This is what the screen looked like. This is actually a black and white reprint, but it was the first time a commercial network hosted a place for teachers where they could go. Then in 1989, Roger Wagner released a program called HyperStudio that became all the rage for a long time, right? The multimedia age began. And HyperStudio was basically a blank screen with a toolbox that allows you to paint, draw, add sounds, add movies, and add buttons to connect all different um, scenes together. Here's a quick example of what it looks like. This is from the HyperStudio website that's up now. And you can see here's a thing on volcanoes. And basically, these students designed a project where you can click on a button, it goes to another screen, shows you information, go back to the home page, click on another button, and once again, it allowed them to bring their learning to life by making these reports that were very interactive and, um, and very compelling. And then the 90s began, and you know, at that point, we started to ask kids, like, what do you think about the future of technology? And I found this was in a, a computer newsletter in 1991. They asked these two girls, and they said, if we could invent anything, we would invent a computer that would type out what you dictate to it. It would automatically use correct punctuation, spelling, and grammar. This would be called the dictator. And boy, they were not far off. I mean, later on, this program came out. Max Speech Dictated did exactly what they, what they wanted. So having the voice of kids is really also important in this journey. And then simulations, well, they were more than just text-based now. Suddenly, they had graphics. And the company MEC, Minnesota Educational Computer Company, made many of the classic ones. I know we all know this one. I had to put it in here because it's on the cover of the brochure, the Oregon Trail, right? And basically, the Oregon Trail was revolutionary in that it was a simulation that included graphics. They were kind of cartoony. I mean, by today's standards, they weren't great. But it really made this learning very compelling. And of course, I'm not going to go over the Oregon Trail. Many of you probably played it in school. Um, but you can go through the trail. And it included, of course, some animation as well. And we all know the challenges of the Oregon Trail were you know, going through the rivers and doing some other things that pre presented challenges. Um, I actually did the screen recording from the Internet Archives. You could actually go on the Internet Archive today and play Oregon Trail on your computer. You don't need an Apple IIe. It just plays on the web. So if you want to relive those memories, you can. And here we are. And of course, the big thing in the Oregon Trail was we had to go hunting, right? And um, this is where you know, the video game industry influenced ed tech, and you had to go and shoot animals. I was not a very good uh, shot, as I'm trying to recreate this here, on the computer. But it was really exciting for kids to have kind of this video game piece of what, what they were doing in their learning. They also created games like Odell Lake, which were simulations about the environment and food chains and some other things as well. And there was a, an, a lot of drill and practice software that, that came out. We didn't really use a lot of that in my district because we tried to use software tools, but Reader Rabbit was something that was popular, number munchers. Once again, the influence of the video game industry. In this case, we have the muncher who has to go around and eat all the multiples of three. It was a lot like Pac-Man, because um, you had to go around and do that and involve some thinking because it involves some understanding of math, of course. And if you made a mistake, it would tell you um, that eight is not a multiple of three. 
And then there was some creative software that came out at the time. Storybook Weaver was really popular by Mech as well, where you could put backgrounds on, on your page and you could put characters and then write about them. And that initiative started. And of course, in 1992, everything changed when CD-ROMs really became popular. And we have interactive CD-ROMs for the first time with the Grolier Multimedia Encyclopedia that was seen as an unbelievable resource at the time. You had a whole encyclopedia on a disc, which is game changing. And then of course, Grandma and Me and all the living books that came out for the younger kids, which were interactive storytelling things. And then Microworlds Project Builder, the next version of Logo that was a, you know, a lot like um, Hyper Studio because you could have buttons and interactive things. We were beta testing that for the company up in Canada and used it a lot. And this is a project that actually I do with my students. We design snowflakes, we call them 3D snowflakes, but you can do a lot of other things with MicroRails Project Builder. You could make reports, um, all kinds of things like that that included programming. And Brian Silverman, who was the one who actually programmed a lot of this, came down to our school and talked to the students about MicroRails Project Builder. I helped students um, with a project that I created called Pinball Math. And the idea is that all the students, every fifth grader, would create an interactive pinball machine. They would program it using MicroWorlds Project Builder. You know, and back then, the turtle could be turned into an object. They could make it into a ball. It could react to its environment. And they made these games. And the students would stay in from, indoor, from outdoor recess to work on their games. They were just so compelled to do this work. Um, and they talked about it as the good math. Like They knew they were doing math, but they really enjoyed this kind of work. That story got picked up by the Wall Street Journal and they wrote um, this kind of scathing article about the edtech industry called PCs may be teaching kids the wrong lessons. But luckily, the part where they covered my program was a section called Some Software Nurtures Creativity. <laughs> and they talked about the work that I was doing with students. <laughs> so I was good for a little bit. Um, and then it got picked up by the Charles Osgood Show and some other things um, happened. And that really helped push things forward. When I went to Macworld Boston, um, they unveiled the Power Macintosh, which was a big breakthrough of the day. And then a good colleague, um, good friend of mine too, we went to a conference in New York at the Marriott Marquis. It was called The Internet. It was by Adobe. And it basically was, what is this thing called The Internet? You know, and they talked about what it was gonna be, and they talked about Adobe PageMill, the product they were gonna use to help people design things. And once again, there were naysayers. You know, there was an issue of logo update that came out that said, you know, what happened to the revolution? What about this computer revolution? It's 1996. This technology is really not revolutionizing anything. In 97, I went to Seattle to the National Educational Computer Conference where they unveiled the iOmega zip disk because, you know, multimedia required a lot of storage. So here you go. You had 100 meg, I think, on your zip drive, and you can store things on that. And I loved getting all the buttons I had at different conferences. You know, iOmega always had some very funny ones with the I there, uh, picking up some of the culture at the time. They put, I am not Bill Gates, because while well, Bill Gates was at the conference, he spoke from Microsoft. And here, the wars are really heating up, right? You had Bill Gates speaking. And then Guy Kawasaki, who was the first um, evangelist at Apple. And then Steve Wozniak even came and spoke to the group. So IBM, Apple. You see, they even put them next to each other. Their boots were next to each other. They're almost, they almost like encouraging them to fight, right? They had them right next to each other. And, uh, you know, it's always been a competition on war in technology. It was first Apple versus IBM, which had the better computer. And then it became Apple versus Microsoft, who had the better operating system. And Apple versus Intel, Intel had the fastest chip. And Apple versus Google, you know, it's going to be Chromebook versus iPad. But that became a theme through the years of um, ed tech. And then 1998 in Macworld, New York, Apple unveiled this computer that really had a significant impact on educational technology, right? It's the first iMac, the G3 iMac. And they say, I came, I saw iMac. That was a t-shirt I got at the time. And it was really a revolutionary device. It came in two colors, Bondi blue and ice. And basically it was a big hit um, being sold to schools. Then a year later, they came out with this device. Um, here's the brochure for it. This is the MacBook and uh, iBook, I'm sorry, and it basically was a, a laptop design just for schools. So with those two devices, they really started to make headway into schools again. And that was all dependent, of course, on the airport, the wireless device they had to connect everything together. Well, 
I was observing this and seeing a lot of people making money and things like that, and my wife and I said, you know, maybe you should start a software company. And I'd gone on a class trip with some fifth graders to Ellis Island. It had just opened up the Ellis Island Museum, and the students really just kind of ran around. They didn't understand the history that happened there. So together, my wife and I wrote this program called They Came to Ellis Island, which took kids on a tour through Ellis Island, and then it let them play a simulation where they would take on the role of, a sim of an immigrant go to America, make decisions, make Ellis Island. And it was just like that other program, the Oregon Trail, except for Ellis Island. There was no hunting, but basically it was um, the same style of that program. And you know, our goal was to buy a car, and we sold the program. It shipped on four different floppy drives, the old three-and-a-half-inch floppy drives. And at the end of about a year, we had enough money from software sales to buy that car. And it was used by a lot of schools across the country. Um, and still one of my favorite uh, projects that I worked on. Well, back in 2001, we had high-speed internet and Mark Prensky, who coined the term digital natives and digital immigrants. And this became a talking point for many people in educational technology, the idea being that students who have only grown up with this technology are the natives using it, and adults who didn't grow up with the technology are the immigrants. And that became an interesting way to think about it. In 2007, we had the first National Educational Technology Standards. And this is the first time teachers from around the world got together, also with companies, and decided that these are the things that all students should learn in school. Those standards, called the NET standards, N-E-T-S, National Educational Technology Standards, really drove a lot of curriculum in that day. 2007 was also the year that Google entered the conversation. And Google had an open call for educators to serve as Google certified teachers. You had to apply to this program. It was very competitive. It took, I remember I filled out the application. It took me an entire day. You had to make a video of yourself and submit other kinds of things. And um, I was really lucky. I was selected for the program in New York and spent a couple days at Google in New York City. And I became ultimately a Google certified teacher. And that was a cool experience because you could sit and work with the people who were developing like Google Earth and all these other products um, who were helping us design teaching tools for this. Google was very clear at the time that they had no interest in doing anything in education. It's not part of their company mission, but they wanted to do this and just see what happened. Now, I, m when I went to Google's offices in New York City, my eyes were open. I mean, here are people during the day playing pool, you know, working. They had scooters going from room to room, and they had these things called micro kitchens where you could just sit down and eat as much as you want snack bars, and it was a whole different co uh, company culture than I had in school. And later on, um, after working in the program, we had a reload that was organized by one of the other Google certified teachers, and I had a chance to speak back to the group about some of the learnings that happened. And ultimately, they turned into a Google certified innovator program to make it sound more contemporary. Well, Google entered the conversation, but also Steve Jobs unveiled his one device. And this revolutionized not just technology, but society as we know it, right? social media, everything that's associated with having that first iPhone um, has really transformed everything we do. And then finally, 2007, the web becomes interactive. So it's not just a place you go to to read. Will Richardson, who's a pioneer in educational technology, wrote the book in 2010 called Blogs, Wikis, and Podcasts, telling teachers that students could go on the web and create content, and he called it the Read, White, Write Web. And the other thing that was starting to happen is that, you know, we realized that little kids really don't do a lot of text coding very well. And so Scratch was born up at MIT, and they um, created this programming language that's based on blocks. So the idea is that all of the code can be done by putting blocks together. This is one I'm just going to walk through very quickly. Uh, here's what it looks like. So on my screen, I have the Scratch cat, who is the sprite, the object that's going to move. And on the left side of the screen, I've already pre-selected from this long list of coding blocks, some coding blocks that I'm going to use to make this cat move. Ultimately, I want to make it go on the screen and bounce around. So I have this action block that's a flag. This is when I click on the green flag, it's going to move. I have a repeat block. I have a move block. If I click on that, the cat will move 10 spaces at a time. And what I'm going to do is also take a look at having the um, cat turn around, I have it do a right 180, I could have it turn really any direction. But if I put these blocks together so that when the green flag is kicked, clicked, it repeats 100 times, go forward 10 steps, and then if 
the cat touches the color black, so I'm gonna drag that if then block in and put the color black in, I'm gonna have it actually turn 180 degrees. That could change any of the numbers that I have here on the screen. And so when I click it, the cat will go forward until it hits a black ball, and then it'll turn 180, and it'll keep doing that a thousand times. And that's the basic concept behind a lot of the game programming you could do with things like Scratch. Of course, you could always go and change the cat and make it something else. You could make it into an object, into a ball, into a person. Here's an example. Um, of someone who made a soccer game. Basically, they turned the cat into a clip art person, this girl, who then can kick the ball into the goal, it hits red, and they score the goal. So using that basic concept can be developed further into make more complicated games. This is one um, that my son actually did. He was very interested in NASCAR. So he made this game in Scratch where there's a racetrack and you can actually go and change the track by clicking on it making different tracks, and then, of course, you click the arrows on the key, and the race would begin, and there's a car going around the screen, and you're controlling it, and if it hits black, that means your car has crashed, and it says, I crashed. So, once again, basic game design can be incorporated into this. And then in 2010, we have the modern era of bed tech. Um, something called the SAMR model was developed by a, a professor called Dr. Ruben Puentadora, who said there's actually a way that technology changes things, it starts out by substituting what you do, then it augments what you do, then it modifies it, and ultimately it redefines it. it, it technology allows you to do something you could never do before. That same year, um, the new technology plan came out from the federal government. It was called Learning Powered by Technology. Notice they purposely put the word learning first. So they're finally getting the message that it's not about computers, it's about what kids are doing. And of course, the iPad, Became, uh, came out, was the first post-PC device, as Steve Jobs called it. The app marketplace was brand new, and there was a camera for every student for the first time in classes. And then in 2013, Scratch 2.0 was released. The big thing here is that Scratch was on the web, so now students could take their projects, they can share them, they could remix other projects, and built this huge international Scratch community that still exists today. Of course, along the way, in technology, there are always parent concerns. You know, the pendulum swings from technology is amazing to technology is addictive and distracting. Um, anyway, I then made another trip out west. Um, this time, I went to Apple and Google. Google was the one that actually wanted me to go out there for this event. But I was at Apple, and all I can say is that this is the T-shirt that I have, so I really can't say anything <laughs> about the Apple experience. But I was at Google. And, um, you know, if you go to Google in California, it's very different than New York. In Mountain View, it's a campus. I mean, you could literally walk around like a college campus. And I was out there in residence for two or three days. Um, people travel between these buildings on these Google bikes, so, you know, I couldn't resist, right? You had to hop on the bike to go between buildings. But the project that I was asked to um, be part of or participate in early on was for a new device they were working on. One of the things also in California that was impressive was that the haircut bus would actually drive to the campus and, and give people haircuts at work, which is kind of interesting. But it was Google's answer to the iPad, and it was a Chromebook. And this is the CR48. This is the f a Chromebook that was given to people to test, but they never actually manufactured it. Google really doesn't manufacture hardware. They give it to other people to manufacture. But basically, they had asked us questions about how this Chromebook could be used in classes, and we did some focus group work with them. The one thing on the Chromebook that you'll see is that they added a search button, because after all, it's Google, right? So search is really important to them. And ultimately, our school district, like many other districts, purchased these cartloads of Chromebooks that were used in our upper grades, um, and ultimately, in high school and middle school and later years. At the same time, my colleague Lynn Shane and I um, started a, uh, something called the Center for Innovation at our district to really think about the future of school. And we invited Tony Wagner to come and speak. He uh, wrote the book called Creating Innovators. And he said, it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know that counts. And that became embodied in the new education technology standards in 2016 when they shifted the roles of students from doing things to actually being the learner. So watch how the language changes. Here are the new technology standards. These are still in existence today. Empowered learner, digital citizen, et cetera. 
And these are the old technology standards. So it shifted from what they do to who they are. And those are the technology standards we have. And those technology standards are spelled out on the ISTE website. If you have kids, you may want to go and check them out to see what, you know, what students are supposed to be doing today with technology. And then we have the STEAM movement, um, which came back again, this time in full force with the Maker Faire, so many other things. And this classic book written by uh, Sylvia Libo Martinez and Gary Steger called Invent to Learn. And this became a call to action for people in the community because it talked about how students could use computers for fabrication, you know, laser printing, uh, 3D printing, um, physical computing, and of course programming as well. And then STEM became STEAM. We added the arts to the acronym because we needed students to be creative in doing this. This is an actual project of some college students who made some electric guitars. Um, these are engineering students but also made them also have designs as well. So marrying engineering and also the arts and 3D printing and all the things associated with that movement. Then programming became cool again. Now we call it coding and eventually computational thinking, which is a way of thinking that we know that programming helps kids do, but it's a way of thinking that they should do in every subject, even if they're not coding, right? All of the things I have on the screen, what we want kids to do to be successful. And there were parent concerns again, you know, we want them to have more steam, more coding, but at the same time, you know, all the screen time is happening. We want to balance that out. And then there were conferences. Google this time eventually had a booth at the conference as well. And in 2015, I went to the National Computer Conference and had a chance to actually meet Roger Wagner, the guy who designed HyperStudio many years ago. He's still doing it. It's HyperStudio version 5 now, um, and it's good to see that that project is still active. In 2017, Google released something called the Jamboard that was the um, answer to a lot of smart boards, and this is what it could do. Here it is. It was a 55-inch screen, so it wasn't really good for a full class usage, but you could sketch on it, you could put in graphics, you could use stickies, you can collaborate. It had handwriting recognition and auto-draw, and you know, Google announced this in New York City at an event, and of course I had to be there. And I asked a difficult question. They were only going to manufacture these for businesses. And I asked, why not offer them to schools? And they talked about going slow and that this is really a collaborative device, not understanding maybe at the time that schools were trying to build collaboration as well. This is what the Jamboard looked like. Eventually, I got one. Um, and it had handwriting recognition. You can see it actually thinking as I'm writing. And it's turning my terrible script into actual words. And it has auto draw built in. You know, if you go to the website and you know look for auto draw, you can actually do this on the web. I'm writing a computer on the screen. It says, "You mean this?" And I click on it, and it turns it into the actual image. You can imagine as a teaching tool, this is really a cool thing to have in your classroom. And then the last piece of technology I used before I retired was this um, technology, which is called Merlin Mind, and basically it recognizes teachers' voices and automates what you want the computer to do. So I could just talk in my classroom and tell my computer to bring up a slideshow and advance to the next slide and things like that, and it'll automatically do that. It's kind of like having Siri in the classroom. And then the pandemic happened. That was uh, just a real terrible time for all of us in education. It was stressful. It, was, you know, it wasn't great for teachers or students, but we, we somehow made it through, and Zoom really helped save us in many ways and helped education continue going. And even colleges now are having questions about, you know, how are we going to teach in the future? Is it through online education? Is it a hybrid? Is it a mix? Things like that. So where are we today? Well, we have simulations, of course. They continue. We get more sophisticated than ever. You can go, for example, to MIT's website and use the En-ROAD simulation. This lets you go and control different variables and see how they could affect climate change in the future. So a really interesting thing for students to do. 20 things to do with the computer, well, Gary Steger um, wrote a book basically asking educators today about that, so we're revisiting that years later. There's generative AI, I think we all know about this, like programs like Dolly. I did a presentation a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to have pictures of um, teachers reading to students, and I asked it that in a prompt, and it generated these pictures for me. These are all generated by the computer. The graphics aren't great, but for what I wanted to do, it worked, because I wanted to talk about the idea of storytelling, and so I put the pictures in here, went into Photoshop, changed them up a little bit, 
and that became the opening slide of the presentation. So AI is working as my assistant in putting that together. And then of course, ChatGPT, just for fun, I took one of my papers from grad school, one of the assignments put in ChatGPT, and it wrote the essay for me. So I could have completed my degree in a lot shorter time if I had access to technology like this. And actually, the essay was pretty good. Um, and you know, we always make jokes when students graduate, thanks Wikipedia, someday it may be ChatGPT for helping them along. But as a society and as a school district, we have to start dealing with these issues of what AI allows students to do and how we can make it productive in terms of their educational program. And that Ellis Island program, well, I want to bring it back. I'm working on something now to make it more modern in a book where students can actually go into a simulation and learn about Ellis Island today. Well, Star Wars is back, right, for this generation, right? That's come back. And um, I hear that Tom is coming back this summer, right? Mission Impossible 8. And sadly, those Russian nuclear mi missiles never went away, still here at a problem today. So some things really don't change. Going back to that article I discussed in the beginning, Computers in the Schools, What Revolution? The question is, was there really a revolution? What happened? Was there a mini revolution? Who did the revolution affect? I can tell you this, there was a revolution. And I know because I was there for that revolution. Thank you so much. I have three minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes. Right. I, you know, I think that the vision for that was um, a good vision in the sense that, you know, every student needed their own technology, almost their own assistant to keep with them. That evolved into the iPad and the Chromebook. I mean, that became, you know, he was looking at it for as a cheap solution. I think it was like, what, 100 or $200? Um, and they discovered that, you know, I think you needed to put a little more money into the device to make it more useful for students. But I think the vision was good. It just didn't see its way through. But it eventually led to things like the one-to-one -one initiatives that we've used, you know, in, in almost every school at this point. Anyone else? Yes, Lisa. <laughs> Liza. <laughs> Sorry. Well, right, I mean, we talk about the digital divide, right? The fact that some students, even in this country, don't have access to technology. A lot of the technology that I'm showing you, I was fortunate that I worked in school districts that supported, you know, having the latest technology and had resources to do that. But even in America, too, right? We don't have equitable access to technology. And it's a big problem, um, I think, because if you think about technology and what it affords to students, it gives them power, it gives them access to resources. And if we don't give everyone access, it creates a, a big problem in terms of inequities within our, the, the learning that happens in classes. And of course, if you look internationally, it's even more severe, right? And many countries don't even have access to networks or internet. But it's something that I, you know, is so essential, giving students access to technology, that's a problem we just have to solve. That's a good point, thank you. Yes. So yes, I mean, I've, you know, because I worked in school districts, I did work with uh, special ed students. What I can tell you about assistive ed is this. One of the things I do now is I work with software startups, companies that are coming into the industry. And what they're able to do, what their plans are with using artificial intelligence to help students move forward just blows me away. You're gonna see products come to market in the next year that are gonna be very sophisticated in terms of their ability to analyze student work and offer student assistance. Um, and I think that's gonna start to move within the next year or two forward with products that will do that. Assistive technology is, has been game-changing for students that have disabilities. 
because it really gives them the opportunity to um, do things they couldn't do before having that assistance with the technology. So it's absolutely critical for those students. Liza, yes. The mainstream. And you're up next, Eliza, right? You're going to talk about this, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I appreciate it. My time's up, and I'm happy to talk to one after the show. Thank you.